What's going on everybody? I'm Johnny Brook. Welcome back to another Crafter Workshop video. And in today's video, I'm gonna show you how to build this really cool little end table. It's got a burnt Shushugiban base, and best of all, it's got built-in hidden wireless charging. All right, let's go and get started with the build. I had some leftover offcuts of this reclaimed oak from the dining table project I built for my parents a couple of weeks ago. And I wanted to build something that would use up all of these pieces, and I figured a couple end tables would be the perfect project for it. So the first step when working with this reclaimed material is to check for any metal debris like nails that are hiding in the wood and I used a metal detector to do that. After checking the wood and removing any of the hidden nails, I could start breaking down the pieces to rough size using the miter saw and bandsaw. And I really like to rip material like this at the bandsaw as most of these boards weren't even close to flat. And I used the jointer to flatten one reference edge before ripping at the bandsaw, but you can see just how cupped some of these boards were. Once the pieces were broken down to their rough size, I could finish milling the boards, first getting one face and one edge square at the jointer, and then bringing them to final thickness at the planer. I could then rip the boards to final width at the table saw and cut them to final length at the miter saw. Now, most of these steps could easily be skipped if you just purchase pre-milled lumber like the stuff you'd find at your home center. Also, most lumber dealers will mill your boards for you for a small fee, and this is a really great way to save yourself from having to use a jointer and a planer. The pieces you've seen me working on up until this point were the legs and cross supports, and next I needed to cut the joinery that attaches those pieces. I decided to show two types of joinery here, as I know some people don't have access to all the tools I have. First, I used dowel joinery, which is a really simple and extremely strong method for joining two boards. Using a dowel drilling jig, I drilled a matching pair of holes into the leg and cross support, then I could do a test fit, which resulted in a tight, really strong joint. Next, I pulled out my domino and cut similar joinery, and as you can see, the domino is a little bit faster and more efficient, but both joints are plenty strong. Once the joinery was cut into all the legs, I can move on to adding a taper to both edges of the legs. And it's important to cut your joinery before doing this, as you don't have nearly as much of a reference surface once the tapers are cut. I set up my tapering jig at the table saw to remove a portion of the inside edge, and the exact dimensions will be reflected in the plans, which I'll link to below and then I ripped the taper onto all the legs. Once the tapers were cut on the inside edges of the legs, I could set up the tapering jig to cut another taper on the outside edge of the legs and repeat the process. And this taper on the outside of the legs gives the legs a slightly splayed look. The next piece I needed to work on was this little triangular block that connected the three cross supports, and figuring out how to join these three legs like that was a real trick, and this is what I came up with and actually worked really well. So first I cut a few triangular blocks from some of the smaller pieces of oak over at the miter saw, and this was as simple as setting my saw to 30 degrees and making a couple of cuts. Next I nipped off the sharp corners as I figured they would be fragile and have a tendency to break off anyway. Once I had the blocks cut to size, I could clear away some of the waste from the center of each of the sides, and I used sliding dovetails to join the cross supports to this center block, and it's really best to remove as much waste as you can before moving over to the router table as it puts a lot less strain on the bit. And I made sure the areas I cleared at the table saw were just slightly smaller than what would be removed with the router bit in the next step. Speaking of which, next I could move over to the router table, and I installed this dovetail bit and set the bit height to just over half an inch, slightly higher than what I removed at the table saw, and I set the fence so that the bit would remove just enough material from that inside edge of the groove to cut in that dovetail shape without removing so much as to strain the bit. Once the bit was set up, I could then make a pass, clearing out one half of the dovetail, flip the piece around 180 degrees, and then make a second pass, completing the dovetail groove. And one other key here is to make sure the width of your dovetail groove is narrower than the thickness of those cross support pieces, otherwise you won't be able to cut a matching dovetail onto those pieces. Now to cut those matching dovetails, I moved the fence in so only a portion of the bit was exposed, and used a scrap the same thickness as the cross supports to dial in my bit setting. You want the size of the dovetail on the cross supports to be just slightly smaller than the dovetail groove in the triangular blocks. Not so tight that you have to wail on them to get them into place, but not so loose that the joint wouldn't be strong. Before cutting the dovetails into the cross supports, I cut the cross supports to their final length of the miter saw, and then started cutting the dovetails. As you can see, I used that same scrap block as a backer board behind the cross supports to avoid as much tear out as I could on that trailing edge. Oak is pretty stringy, especially this older reclaimed oak, so I still got a little bit of tear out, but no one will ever really see these pieces, so it wasn't a huge deal. 
Once all of the dovetails were routed into the cross supports, this is what they looked like. And you'll only need three of these pieces for each table, but I was building two of them, so I had six. Next, I went ahead and drilled some countersunk holes into the cross supports of the drill press, and I'll add screws through these holes to attach the base to the tabletop later. And it's a lot easier to drill these holes nice and square at the drill press before assembling the base and trying to do it with a handheld drill. With all the joinery cut, I could start gluing up the pieces, and first I glued the cross supports to the legs using both dowels and dominoes, as you can see. After the glue dried, I sanded the pieces, making sure the faces of the legs and cross supports were nice and flush, and that any of the burn marks from the table saw were removed, and then I moved back over to the router table to add a roundover to the edges of the legs. And this roundover makes the legs and cross supports really flow together nicely, and also gives the legs an almost turned look at the bottom. You'll also notice that I had to add these temporary screws to those countersunk holes, as otherwise the bearing on the roundover bit was dipping into those holes and kind of messing up the roundovers. Once the roundover was added, I could sand the pieces up to 120 grit and then assemble the base. I added glue to the dovetail grooves and then added the leg assemblies, and I first tried to use a strap clamp to clamp everything together, but the tapered outside edge of the legs made the straps slide up the legs, so on to plan B, I added some F-style clamps across the center of the base, and this worked out really well. After the glue dried, I sanded away any of the squeeze out, and then I could move on to the main event, burning the table base. So I didn't really know what to expect with this whole Shushugiban process, I've only done it once before, but it was incredibly easy. I burnt the bases on top of my welding table, and it's a really good idea to do this on a non-flammable surface. Some metal sawhorses would also work really well here. I used the Burnsomatic TS8000 torch and their map gas, which burns a little bit hotter than propane, and the whole process went extremely quickly. One really nice thing about this particular torch is that you don't have to hold down the button the whole time you're using it. You can lock it into the on position and just go to work. I just kept moving the torch around, making sure every surface of the bases had a nice even char and avoided staying in one spot for too long. I didn't really want that intense alligator char look, I just wanted to blacken the surface of the wood evenly. And while I'm burning the wood, let's talk about the sponsor of this week's video, Burns-O-Matic. burns has been the leader in the blowtorch category since 1876, providing durable, safe, and dependable products. The burns TS-8000 I used on this project is perfect for use on soldering and brazing jobs, and is also great for larger jobs and projects that require a bit more heat like this one. I've owned this particular torch for a few years now and have used it for everything from lighting my scrap wood burn bin to popping bubbles in epoxy and even searing steaks after cooking them in my sous vide. To learn more about the TS8000 and burns other products, check out the link in the video description below and thanks again to burns for sponsoring this week's video. Once the Shushugi Bond process was done, the base was pretty much ready for finish, so next I worked on the tabletops. And once again, I broke down the pieces over the miter saw milled them square at the jointer and planer, and then ripped them to final width at the table saw. And with the tabletop board squared up, I arranged the boards into their final orientation and laid out some marks where I wanted dominoes. And once again, dowels would work great here as these are really just for alignment. I cut the domino mortises off camera and then I could go ahead and glue up the tabletops. One thing I've learned over the last few years is that you don't need tons of glue squeeze out when doing these kinds of glue ups. A thin line of squeeze out indicates the joint has just enough glue without you wasting a bunch to squeeze out. Once the glue dried, I needed to cut the tabletops into circles, and there are a ton of ways to do this and I've covered multiple methods including using a bandsaw and a router jig in previous videos, which I'll link to in the cards and in the video description, but on this project I wanted to make things nice and easy and used my X-carve to cut the circles. After the X-carve finished, I cut the tabs which held the piece in place using a chisel, and then moved over to the router table. I wanted to add a heavy chamfer to the bottom of the tabletops which really lightens the look of the pieces, and one bonus is that the chamfer bit also removes those little leftover bits from the tabs at the same time. Next I can move on to adding a little extra feature to one of the tables, wireless charging. Now I've done this in a video in the past, but I used the CNC and wanted to show how to do this with more accessible woodworking tools in this video. So first, I wanted to try removing the plastic enclosure from this wireless charger I used last time to see if it improves the range at all. And I know you can buy these standalone wireless charging circuits, but I already had this charger on hand and wanted to see if this would work. After a bit of work, I got the plastic enclosure removed and I could move on to creating a quick template for routing in a recess for the charger. I traced around the charger and power cord onto a scrap piece of half-inch plywood, making sure to leave enough room for the half-inch template bit I used to route the recess, and then I could cut the template out with the jigsaw. 
Now, this doesn't need to be perfect at all as this won't be visible from the top of the table. You just need to make sure you have enough room for the charger and power cord. After cutting out the template, I used some double-sided tape to attach the template to the bottom of the tabletop, making sure that hole for the charger was nice and centered. Also, I love this particular brand of double-sided tape. It leaves no sticky residue when you remove it and it's incredibly strong. I'll link to it in the video description below. With the template in place, I could start routing. And on this first pass, I didn't really need to worry about my exact depth as I knew I'd have a lot more material to remove. I just needed to make sure that I plunged deep enough so that the bearing on the template bit would ride on the template. So I cleared out the entire section for the charger and went about halfway back in the groove for the cord. Now, I didn't need a very deep groove coming out of the very edge of the tabletop for the cord, but I had to plunge this bit to a certain depth to make sure the bearing was riding on the template. To get around this, I tacked a few more plywood offcuts along the edges of the cord groove area, and then used that as my reference surface to finish routing the groove for the cord. After making sure the groove was deep enough to hold the cord, I removed the template, and you can see how the groove for the cord kind of steps up. With the template removed, the areas I already routed became the template, and the bearing rode along those newly cut edges. But before continuing, I needed to set my depth stop so I could route to my final depth, and I wanted to leave about 3 16ths of an inch of material on the tabletop, just enough for the charger to work through, so I set my depth stop accordingly. After routing to final depth, I double checked the depth again with a combination square, and then could attach the charger inside the recess. I used hot glue here, which is plenty strong, but makes it really easy to swap out the charger in the future if this technology improves, which we all know it will. And I removed the charger before finishing, so this initial hot glue was really just temporary. Finally, I could test it to see if it worked, and it did, but frankly, this wireless charger has always been really finicky with phone placement, even when using it just as a regular charger, so I'll probably experiment with other chargers in the future. If you have any recommendations, I'd love to hear them in the comments below. Next, I could sand the tabletops up to 180 grit, breaking the edges on the tabletops, and then I can move on to finishing. And I'm sure a lot of you will ask why I didn't use a wire brush to remove the excess char from the wood before finishing, and it's because it didn't seem necessary. Using a wire brush removes a lot of that color that I was going for from the Shushugi Bond process. I figured that if I sprayed on a few coats of polyurethane, the finish would soak into any of those loose bits and hold them in place, and this proved to be true. I sprayed on three coats in total, sanding the surfaces after the second coat. After the finish dried, I reinstalled the charger, again using hot glue, but I also hot glued the cord into the groove this time, just to keep the cord from coming loose if someone bumped into it. Next, I centered the base on the bottom of the top, making sure to avoid the groove for the cord, and then attached the base to the top with a few 2.5-inch screws. And I had drilled two holes into each of the cross supports, but it turned out that one of those holes ended up going into the recess for the charger, and that second screw proved to be unnecessary strength-wise anyway. After assembly, I could test the wireless charger again, and while still a little bit finicky, it worked, and I could call this project done. All right, hopefully you guys enjoyed this project. This was a pretty cool project. It was a little bit challenging trying to figure out how to connect those three legs, but I think that little triangular block with the sliding dovetails ended up working out really well. That's a super strong joint. It's been around forever. It's my first time trying it, but I'm really happy with the way it turned out. They definitely could have been a little bit tighter, but once the glue was added and the glue dried, I could stand on the base by itself, no problem. And really most of that load is on the screws now, since those go up into the tabletop and kind of take a lot of that load off of that sliding dovetail joint. But otherwise, it was a really fun project. The Shushugiban was super simple and quick. It only probably took about 20 minutes to do both of the bases, and I really like the way it turned out. It's mostly black, but you get a little bit of that natural kind of oak color peeking through in the depth of the grain on oak. I, I think oak was a great choice here just because it has that really nice open grain structure. Looks really, really cool. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this one. If you don't already, go ahead and get subscribed. I put out new project videos like this pretty much every week. Also, ring that little notification bell so you don't miss my upcoming videos. Also, I have links to all the tools and materials I use on this project down in the video description below. And last, I want to say another big shout out to burns of matic for sponsoring this project. Again, that Shushugi Bond process was super fun. The TS-8000 torch was really easy. The map gas was plenty hot and the whole process went really quickly. So thanks again for watching everybody. And until next time, happy building.